This is the classic passage in Job chapter 1 of Job, a righteous person undergoing tribulation and suffering because of the devil. The devil gave the challenge to God and the devil said, if Job is really a righteous person, try making him suffer and he'll curse you to your face. It's a classic passage of people who undergo suffering and what to do when the devil attacks and God allows suffering. In Job chapter 1, notice in verse 1, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. Notice in verse 7, And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not thou made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And you'll know from verse 13 through 19, Job has undergone suffering after suffering after suffering after suffering. And how Job responds is in verse 20, then Job arose and rent his mantle and shaved his head and fell down upon the ground and worshipped <clears throat> and said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. What if we were in Job's case? How would we respond to suffering? Well, we have to understand that a lot of case in suffering that Satan, he does hate the child of God. And because you have an enemy, if you really exist, and if you really believe that he does hate you, he don't care what happens to your life and he will do whatever it takes to make sure that you undergo the heaviest stress, the heaviest pain that you can ever bear. And a lot of times Christians don't know what to do have you undergone demonic attacks recently i've been getting people from uh this church about the devil's been attacking them in this one the devil's been attacking them in this one and then how things are colliding usually after summer camp or before a blowout we uh, i usually see that the devil attacking and you know why right because you got a blessing from god or you're gonna get a blessing from god yeah. What is the Bible-believing Christian response to this? Are we prepared when we undergo this? I want to ask you this question, and I hope this sermon will help you. What if Satan makes you suffer? Let's pray. Father, it's a serious question that we don't really think much about, and I pray you'll fill within me the power of the Holy Spirit and the cleansing of the blood, and whatever that you can give to me to preach this sermon effectively. God, I am weak, I am broken, I am sinful, I am incapable, so I need all of you, Father. Use me once more. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Verses 1 through 5 in Job chapter 1. Verses 1 through 5. Notice right here that Job, Job, he's the one who's perfect upright. He feared God. He hated evil. You'll notice right here that he was incredibly blessed at verse 3. You'll also notice that Job is such a good person that in verse 5, he would not only pray and seek forgiveness for his sin, but he'll pray and seek forgiveness for other people's sins. He prays on other people's behalf. As a matter of fact, if you look at the last chapter of Job, God knew that Job would usually intercede on people's behalf, so he said to Job's three friends, I'm not going to forgive you unless you get Job to intercede on your behalf. I mean, Job was such a righteous man, he was such a good man, that he would do better than most of us Christians. I mean, he hated evil. How much would you hate evil? He would sanctify others, pray for others, ask God's forgiveness for others. How often would you and I do that? 
We usually concentrate ourselves, don't we? So Job is such a righteous person. So the question is, why would a man like that, who's probably better than you and I put together, God would let him suffer? Now, I know the typical Christian answer. The typical Bible-believing Christian answer is that righteous people undergo suffering so that they can be rewarded by God in the end. That's the reason why God allows Satan to torment the saved child of God so that the saved child of God can receive the reward. Yea, and all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. I mean, that's inevitable. Uh, look, I already know that, but think about this. We know that righteous people get persecuted so they can get rewarded. But do you recall what persecution does to the righteous person to get the reward? What does persecution do? It purifies the righteous person so that the person can get the reward. Now, I know some of you are like, I already know of that, Pastor. That's right. Amen. Praise the Lord. No, I don't think you really do know. What does purify mean? It means to clean off the impurities. Now, what does that mean? When God lets persecution happen or suffering happen, it burns off the impure parts out of us. Basically, your sins. Now, isn't that hard to believe? I mean, you're a righteous person. You serve the Lord. You've done nothing wrong. But the Lord lets suffering happen because there's still some sin in you that he has to clean up. Look, I'm not talking about chastisement here, where a saved child of God is messing up in sin and God has to let him suffer something so that he can learn his lesson, repent of the sin and get back to God. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a righteous person who has no idea, who has uh, no knowledge of committing any sin against God. This is a person who read the Bible, prayed, got rid of all his sins, and made sure he lived for God. Or so he thought. Because what suffering does, and you know this to be true, it pushes us to our limits. It really pounds our flesh. And what happens is the ungodly sinful parts, the dark parts of our flesh, finally get exposed and come out that we never thought before. You know, I thought that I was a very nice, loving guy until I married my wife. When I married my wife, I realized, man, you're an ungodly, mean, unloving person. But I thought I was. You know why? Because when I undergone the relationship with her, we went through the tensions, we suffered much together, and that tension forced the impure, ungodly parts to come out. Now, you and I know that. You might be like a good Bible-believing Christian right now, but what if the devil started to attack you? Would the bitterness come out? Would the wrong thoughts come out? Would even the sins that you thought you got victory over suddenly pop to the scene and you're repeating that habit again? That's the reason why God lets righteous, godly, Bible-believing Christians, yes, even people like Job, who are more righteous than us, to undergo pain to expose the ungodliness inside of us that we never saw. Why would God do something like that? Well, the reason why is if he never did it, then Satan, who knows about your weakness when you don't, the sinful part inside you that's hidden that you don't, when Satan sees that, he could tempt you with something out there that will make you commit something worse if that has not been cleansed by the fire, if that sinful part has not been purified by the fire. See, suffering purifies that dross inside you so you can come out like fine gold. That way when the devil tempts you in the future or you face the similar scenarios, you're ready, you can handle it. But if you don't go through suffering, God can't burn that impure part out of you, and then the devil's like, oh, I see that. I can take advantage of that with this temptation. Right. And you might fall into that temptation if you're not careful. Does this make any sense to you, or is this a little deep? Basically, if God don't burn off that impure part out of you with suffering, then that sin, that hidden sin you don't know about is still in you. And then one day in the future, Satan will plan his timetable. He'll have a plan ready. Well, he'll make 
uh, well, he, where he's going to make that temptation so big, so much that you want to surrender to, that that hidden part, that demon inside you that you never thought was in you will finally come out and you mess up in something really, really bad. That's why suffering must happen. Why? There's still some kind of selfishness, self-centeredness, pride, flesh, weakness still in there that must be cleansed, that must be cleansed. Job knew this, but uh, he didn't re realize that this purification is related to his sin. Job's a righteous person, but all in all, he has sin in him, and God needed to purify that. Job mentioned at 23 verse 10, but he knoweth the way that I take. When he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. Right. There's another reason if God never cleansed Job's impurity inside, his sin inside, then what would happen is he would remain self-righteous, which was Job's problem. Right. Right. You didn't know that? That was Job's exact problem. In Job 32, verse 2, the Bible says, Then was kindled the wrath of Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzite, of the kindred of Ram. Against Job was his wrath kindled, because he justified himself rather than God. If you want to find Job's sin in the book of Job, it was his self-righteousness. But this is a man that loved God, that served God, that went to church, that read the Bible, that prayed, that was humble too. I don't think he was a prideful show-off. He was a humble guy. But then that suffering hit him hard. And then Job, you know what he was thinking? Like some of you, God, why did this bad thing happen to me? Yeah. What do you mean by me? Okay. You don't deserve it? Okay. You're good? good? You've done so much work for the Lord? Aren't you a good boy? You know what happens is that if God doesn't cleanse that sin in you with suffering, what's going to happen is this, is that suffering makes us see our weaknesses, right? Yeah. When God pushes us to our limit area, the weak parts come out. That's what suffering does. But here's the problem now. If that weak part is not exposed by suffering, then what could happen is this. Then if not suffering, there's going to be other scenarios we go through that our weak parts are going to be pushed or exposed. And here's our part, like, you know, when our weak part gets exposed, maybe it's laziness, but you thought you got the victory over laziness, and then you read your Bible and prayed faithfully every day. I've done it, I've done it, I've done it. And then here comes the tempter tempting you. Oh, aren't you tired? Oh, it was a long day at work. Don't you, you've been going through a stressful time at home. Your health is so bad, but you overcame that, and you read your Bible and prayed. Now, what I would do after that is I would go, man, praise the Lord. I overcame that. I overcame that by the grace of God. But you don't realize that kind of statement could be unconscious pride. Because there are other people who might be lazy out there who skip their Bible reading and prayer. And then here you are ministering to those people. Here you are fellowshipping with those people. And as you're ministering or fellowshipping with those people, you know what goes on in your mind? Because it will go on in my mind. If that person keeps yielding to laziness again and skips Bible reading and prayer again, what happens is there's frustration in you. And you go, look, I was able to overcome laziness. Why can't you do that too? I know it's hard. It's not easy. I've been down the road like you, but I can overcome it. You can overcome it too. Well, there's truth in that statement, but you don't realize this. That's a little bit of pride in there. Why? Because you thought you overcame the laziness because you were strong enough. Because you resisted well. Whereas the other person didn't, wasn't as strong as you. Didn't resist it well enough. So you're not at fault, but it's that person's fault. That's what's going to happen. And that's self-righteousness. I'm better than you. I handle temptation better than you. I serve God better than you. That's what happens if you're not careful. Hey, did you ever thought about this? You ever thought about the, maybe the reason why you were able to do your Bible reading and prayer and overcome laziness is because you did not share the same life as that other person who went through the same sinful struggle as you? You don't know what that person's been through. You don't know, uh, would you like to share that person's body? 
and mind, how would you handle suffering then? Imagine being in that person's guilt and frustration with sin, self-defeatist attitude. You think that your self-righteousness will encourage that person to get back and serve God? See, that's the danger. That's the reason why you got to realize, hey, the reason why, let's be honest, the reason why you overcame laziness is truly by the grace of God. Not because of your strength, not because you did a good job. It's truly by the grace of God. He put you at a place and a position where you were better able to yield to him and conquer sin. Everything we go through in life, we have to realize it's truly by the grace of God. I didn't preach well because I went through sleepless nights and I racked my brain to preach you a good sermon. It's because of the grace of God of what he put me in my life back then. I was raised to work hard. I was trained to discipline myself. I'm used to going through sleepless nights preaching a great message. I was raised in Sunday school class listening to great preachers. That's why, because God put me in those scenarios and blessed me with those things, I'm able to preach you this message. Not because I'm such a great preacher. Do you understand? And that's the problem with Bible believers nowadays. They got so much pride in them. Self-righteousness. Stop thinking highly of yourself and just thank God instead. Give all the credit to God's grace. The second point is, so my first point is righteousness of Job. My second point is rivalry over Job. Rivalry over Job. If you look at verses 6 through 8 here, notice that Satan comes before God and then God asks Satan the question at verse 7. And verse 8, God challenges the devil. Have you thought about Job? You know, Satan is a rival against you and God. Do you know that in this passage, the Bible says in verse 6, Satan came also among the sons of God who present themselves before the Lord. Verse 7, God says, what have you been doing, Satan? What did Satan answer at verse 7? Oh, uh, enjoying my riches in Babylon. Nimrod and Semiramis are damning uh, thousands to hell and I'm just enjoying a good time. No. In the middle of verse 7, what does it say? Oh, I'm going out committing fornication and adultery like those sons of God back at Genesis 6. No. If you look at the middle of verse 7, it's not I'm enjoying the riches of this world because now I'm the Lord and the king over it. No. You know what Satan was doing? Going to and fro in the earth, walking up and down in it. You know what that is? He is busy going everywhere, considering God's servants at verse 8. Verse 8, God said, have you considered my servant Job? Satan is day and night, tirelessly, looking and inspecting God's saints so that he can accuse them and attack them. Yes. Didn't you uh, read Revelation chapter 12, verse 10? In Revelation 12, verse 10, the last verse says, The accuser of our brethren, that's Satan, is cast down, who accused them before our God day and night. Satan is more prone on spiritual warfare and attacking you than enjoying his worldly possessions, than enjoying the world. He is on the prowl, so busy trying to get on to you. Now, isn't this interesting that if you read the entire book of Job, I could be wrong, but I looked. Job never mentioned Satan one time. Now, the book of Job mentions Satan, but I'm talking about Job himself. If you look at all of his 12 chapters, I think, of his speech, he never mentioned Satan one time. But God did. God mentioned Satan as a big deal. He mentioned him in two chapters. Behemoth and Leviathan. You know what I think? I think it's possible that Job, in spite of being a righteous person, serving God, and he's known as the patient person, he was never prepared for spiritual warfare. Because he never thought about the devil. He never thought about the devil when all these bad things happen. It's like uh, everybody, when bad things happen, the typical answer is it's God's fault. I mean, Job attributed everything to God. Now, it is true, and we're going to discuss about that, how God plays a part, but Job, he didn't think about the devil here. 
And that's the problem with a lot of us is that we always attribute every bad thing to God, but we don't think about the devil. The devil is tirelessly, listen, tirelessly, day and night, trying to find your weakness. And you better bet your soul on it that if he finds your weakness, he's going to use that to make you suffer to the worst that he can. That's the devil. As a matter of fact, if you uh, look at Job chapter 41, Job 41, maybe that's why God had to, when he rebuked Job, he had to tell him about the devil and about battling spiritual warfare when it comes to the devil. Didn't you know that? Look at Job 41. Now notice this ain't, uh, if you believe in this spiritual warfare thing, then you're not going to think Job 41 is a dinosaur, all right? You're going to believe this is real, this is the devil here. If you don't think that this is the devil, then you're going to miss out a nugget, a blessing. In Job 41.1, canst thou draw out Leviathan, Satan with a hook? God's rebuking Job about that. Verse 3, God is making Job think, will he, the devil, make many supplications unto thee? Will he speak soft words unto thee? See, God's making Job think. Do you think the devil's going to go soft on you? Don't you ever thought that he wants to kill you? Look at verse 8. Lay thy hand upon him. Remember the what? Battle do no more. Why would God say that to Job? Hey, you have to think about battling spiritual warfare when it comes to the devil. Why would God, in his rebuke to Job, say that to him? If Job never had that problem, maybe that's why God rebuked him on that. You ever thought about that? Think about this. Job, in Job chapter 1, he was enjoying his worldly possessions, what God blessed him with. He wasn't thinking about the devil. The devil could do this. I got to prepare for spiritual warfare. No, he's lost in enjoying the worldly possessions. But the devil is not busy enjoying his worldly possessions. The devil is busy on spiritual warfare to attack Job. You know what your problem is? You're so lost enjoying the world, you're spending more time enjoying the world rather than the devil enjoying the world. The devil, you are enjoying the world, you're spending more time enjoying the world more than the devil would. The devil is more serious. Listen, the devil is more serious on spiritual warfare than you, and you're not opening your eyes, you don't take that seriously after that? If Satan is taking spiritual warfare more seriously than you, you got a problem, friend. And you got to open your eyes and you got to realize spiritual warfare is real. I must prepare to battle against that wicked one in his temptations, in the trials, in the attacks, the darts of the enemy. If you don't, Keep enjoying your worldly life, your everyday life, because that's what you think. And that's why you curse and get bitter at the end, don't you? Because you're so lost, busy enjoying your normal life, the world. And then when something bad happens, oh God, why did that happen? Blah, 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 and something bad. And then you curse, and then you get, become bitter. Why? That's the fruit of a person who never prepared for spiritual warfare because they're so lost enjoying the world. But if you get off of that and finally think about the devil is out there and he's going to get me if I'm not careful, I must be armed and ready, then that end won't come out of becoming bitter at God. Yeah. People, uh, you notice the problem, why, you ever thought about why third world countries, when they suffer so much more, they respond better to God than rich Americans? Because wow, America is enjoying its normal life, world. And then when something bad happens, then they're like, they get dramatic. They're like, oh, and then they get bitter and some of them become atheists. Yeah. Say that to a bunch of people in third world countries who suffer much worse, yet they love Jesus Christ, they serve him, and they're willing to die for him when being tortured under persecution. Yeah. Get off of that easy going worldly lifestyle. Otherwise you will die. The devil will tear you in half. The third point is verses 9 through 12. Reasons against Job. Reasons against Job. If you look at verses 9 through 12, 
Notice that Satan is reasoning with God, right? Does Job really fear you? Didn't you put a hand of protection upon him? So if you take that away, then he's going to curse you. And then verse, Lord, uh, verse 12, excuse me, the Lord is responding that, hey, all of that is in your power. So do what you want. Just don't touch him. Did Job hear these reasons between the devil and God up in heaven? No, he didn't. He had no idea. If he did, maybe, just maybe, he would have understood why God allowed the bad thing to happen. And he wouldn't be bitter. You might say, why? Because Job would have discovered that Satan, at verse 12, he has the power. He has the right to do what he wants in the world. Now, what did Satan say to Jesus? All this power is given to me in the world. To whomsoever I will, I give it. What does the devil have? He has the power of death, Hebrews chapter 2 says. So if he has the power, that means he, he has the power and the right to do whatever he wants with that. Do you realize that? Taking that into account, what happened when we sinned against God? The Bible says in Romans 5, 12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. Death happens to everyone. Pain and death happens to everyone, not because it's God's fault. But the reason is based because of our sin. Because of our sin, painful things have to happen to everyone. With that into account, and Satan in charge of pain and death, doing whatever he wants, you think that Satan's not going to touch your life with pain. He has the perfect right to do it. Right. Understanding that, we can't just blame it to God easily. Now, I know what most of you are thinking. God is all-powerful, so he could have stopped it if he wanted to. God is all-knowing, so God could have somehow bypassed that where uh, Satan doesn't have to torture my life so much and then keep the rules. Uh, my friend, uh, you think that it's easy for God to do that, but I'm going to shock you for uh, shock you with this. It's not easy for God. Now, before you accuse me of heresy, let me say it this way. It's not easy for God to go against his attribute, who he is. We can all agree with that. God cannot. He cannot do that. That's why the verse says there are some things God cannot do. God cannot lie. All right? Oh, can, God's so powerful and God's all-knowing that he could... No, no, stop that, all right? There's one thing about what makes God powerful, what makes God all-knowing, what makes God holy, what makes God sinless is his attribute. So he can't go against it. Do you understand? Yeah. All right. It's not easy for God to go against his attribute. What is his attribute? Stop focusing on his all-powerfulness and his all-knowing. Why don't you think about his holiness? What does holiness require? Sin must be paid for. How is sin paid for? Pain and death. Starvation, famine, disease, everything bad in this world. Well, that's pretty extreme. Why would God allow that? You're right. To me and you, it's extreme. But God is not our level of holiness. God is so holy, you burn in hell forever for your sin. Do you understand? That's called holiness. He cannot compromise that. He cannot go against that. So because of holiness, sin must be paid for in the most thorough, in the most horrifying, in the most extreme consequence that you can think of. Otherwise, God cannot be holy. You have to understand that. That's like telling a human being to not breathe. All right? Can a human do that? No, because it's who he is. He has to breathe. God is who he is. He's holy. He can't go against that. If he slides the suffering a bit, then you know what happens? If he slides the pain and death in this world a bit, you know what he's doing? He's going against who he is. He cannot do that. Realizing this, okay, if you still think, no, it's easy for God to do it, it's easy for God to solve the problem of suffering, then you try. Stop blaming God. Why don't you take responsibility and be God yourself? 
why don't you be God and follow this rule, okay, if you're going to be God. If you're going to be God, you have to be holy. That means not sliding sin. Otherwise, you cannot be God. You get rid of the meaning of God. Do you understand that? If you're God, you have to. Have to. There's no ifs, man, uh, option. You have to. If you're God, you have to be holy, who makes sure that sin must be paid in the most extreme manner with pain and death. Because his holiness is extreme. That's how extreme his holiness is. If you're God, you have to do that. And at the same time, Satan has the right to use pain and death to whomever he wants. Why? Because that's the price of sin. And Satan knew that. Why do you think Satan tempted Eve? Because he knew he would get the power after that. All right? That's why Satan did that. So Satan has the right to do whatever he wants to people in the world with pain and death. If you got those two things, and that infects everybody in the world, tell me your reason out of that problem. I challenge you. Tell me. How do you reason it out? Don't say, well, God is all-knowing. He could have done that. No, give me details. Stop putting it all on God. You play God. You be in his shoes. And you use your all-knowing mind and think of something. You can't because of his attribute, who he is. Why do you think Satan gave... Uh, Satan did the temptation, Genesis 3, gave the challenge at Job 1. Because Satan knows he's, try, he's not working at God's strengths. He's trying to find any weakness out there, some loophole he can use. Stop blaming God. You be in God's shoes and think. How are you going to reason it out? Well, just wipe it all out. He did. You know that? He did. He wiped it all out, started afresh. Mankind still wouldn't learn their lesson. So what's some other way? Well, he can make mankind not sin. He did that. Mankind still chose to sin. Adam and Eve were sinless, and then they sinned after that. You got, stop blaming God and tell me your reason. You can't. Can you? Let me ask you this question. What if the answer and the solution to reason it out is that I will join them in their pain and death. I will be that substitute and die and be tortured in the most bloody way and take that pain and death upon myself so that their soul can be free from that and then their body, because it's still infected with sin, it has to undergo, but at the rapture it will be changed. All right? Now, what a brilliant God. What an all-knowing God. Don't you think so? If you were in God's shoes, would you do that? I wouldn't. Would you? Let them rot. Let the world rot. They, uh, sin is on them. Let them suffer the pain and death. But God says, no, I love them so much that I will take, I will join them in the pain and death. Understand what they're going through and bear it. Here's the second thing. Do you realize God did that knowing that you would still blame him for being unreasonable? Imagine dying for a bunch of people, being tortured for a bunch of people who's still going to get bitter and mad at you. Ungrateful louses. After God, he didn't have to, but he decided to join in the pain and death with us. I mean, wouldn't that be a being you, you ought to thank, not get bitter and mad? But knowing full well we stupid human beings will still be bitter and mad at him and still sin on top of that. God was willing to be tortured in our place. Now, instead of blaming God, getting upset, shouldn't there be more of gratitude? Yeah. Because if you were in God's shoes, you wouldn't do that. Is this eye-opening to you about God? That's why... Job, he, in Job chapter 40, if you go to Job chapter 40 and verse 4, Job chapter 40 and verse 4, you know what God did? God told Job everything of his ways, his position. You try to be in my shoes, Job. Who created this? Who created that? Can you tell me? Here are my actions here and there. Can you tell me that? He tried to put Job in God's shoes. That's what he did. 
And then what did Job say after that? Look at Job chapter 40 and then verse 4. Job answered in verse 4, Behold, I am vile. What shall I answer thee? I will lay mine hand upon my mouth. Verse 5, I'm not going to speak any further. And then verse 6, God continues. Verse 8, God says to Job, what, are you going to disannul my judgment? Are you going to condemn me so that you can be righteous? Verse 9, hast thou an arm like God? See what God was doing? He was, you know what got Job to open his eyes? When God put Job into his shoes. Make him think about that. That's what you should be reasoning. You got reasons to blame God. Why don't you have reasons to justify God? Okay. Or are you like Job? He justified himself rather than God. Are you like that? Uh, verse 12, if we go back to our main text in Job chapter 1, and then verse 12. Refuge for Job. My next point is refuge for Job. My previous point was reasons against Job. Now, when, uh, let's be honest. When you and I read verse 12, that's a negative verse. You and I would get troubled. God said to Satan, all right, go ahead, uh, wreck his life. You and I would go, oh, Horrible verse, right? You and I would be troubled if we read that. If God said this about you when he talked to Satan, you and I would go, oh God, no, please, no. <laughs> but actually, uh, one is this. One, we've already established uh, from the previous point that uh, it's not God's fault. The second thing is this verse is actually not a verse that should trouble you, but encourage you. You might say, why is that? Because, like I mentioned before from the previous point, this has to happen, all this suffering, all right? Because why? The holiness of God, the heavy extreme consequence of sin, and the devil having the power and the right. There's no other way around it. If you have something, I mean it. I challenge every one of you to come to me and then give me your reasons. I really mean that, okay? But there is no other way around that, whether you like it or not. So this must happen. So the statement in verse 12 is God recognizing, even though this thing must happen, I will put some form of protection. And I can take that pain and death and use it for something good. So see, God did not compromise his holiness. God made sure the devil did what he wanted with pain and death and everyone goes through it. But God did, a, he's so all-knowing, he did a bonus. I'm going to turn that into something good. I'm going to turn that into something where I would reward him double. See, that's the thing about God. God, he protects you. You have to understand. A refuge. There is no safer refuge than to be in God's hands no matter how severe the demonic attack is. Do you understand? No matter how severe Satan might attack, your life, you are still safer in God's hand than in anybody else's hand. Amen. Amen. This verse should be a verse of comfort, not a verse of trouble. Yes. You might say, why is that? Because you don't know your limitations, but God knows your limitations better than you. And he gave a wonderful promise at 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. So God gave a promise that he will, not, he will make sure it doesn't go beyond the limitations. He knows your limitations. When the severity of the suffering hits your limitations, he's going to protect you, keep you there. Amen. He's going to make sure it doesn't break you. I know he can't compromise his holiness. The suffering must be extreme. Yes. You and I have to admit that. You and I have to accept that. Suffering can't just be a regular suffering. Yeah. It has to be something extreme if Satan wants to attack you. It has to be something so severe, so extreme... But at the same time, God makes sure that you're intact. Yeah, that's good. God knows your limitations better than you. So that's the safety. But outside of God's hands, you got to realize you don't know your limitations. And that's why if you don't know your limitations, 
the smallest hardship in life can topple you and destroy you just like that. What if the devil cut all hell loose on you? It's better not to be open prey in the world, doing your own thing in life, but rather to be in the hand of God. I want to assure you, my friend, no matter how bad your home is right now, no matter how bad your health is right now, no matter how trapped you are in your position or how severe your pain is, you're in the best safety that anyone could ever ask for. Oh, that's, good. Yes. that's the refuge. That's the safest. I pity the one who gets outside of God's refuge and thus takes matter in their own hands. Your hands? Your hands? More than God's hands? You better pray the devil don't tear you apart. My fifth point is the ruin of Job. The ruin of Job. If you look at verses 13 through 19, that Job was ruined completely. You'll notice right here that at uh, verse 15, a ruin, and then verse 16, while he was yet speaking, then here comes another ruin. And then verse 17, while he was yet speaking, here comes another ruin. And then verse 18 and onward. Now, that's so horrible. But I would like to suppose something that might be a little eye-opening to you, okay? Now, we know that verses uh, 13 through 19, that's all an attack from Satan, right? We all know that verse 13 through 19, we attribute that to the Lord. God allowed it to happen, right? Okay, so we all know that. But I would like to ask you this question. If verse 15, right? Look at that. The Sabaeans fell upon them, took them away. All right, basically the Sabaeans came and took away Job's livestock. If that verse was separated and then all these other verses weren't there, what would Job think? Oh, I got attacked from, devil, from the devil and God allowed it to happen. No, Job would think that, hey, this ruin that I went through is like any normal scenario that other people go through. Job was not the, the only person the Sabaeans failed to steal his livestock. I'm sure there were thousands of other people too. All right? Here's the second thing I want to add, okay? Let's put this a step further. If we look at verse 16, that's plainly God, all right? That's not a normal event. Notice in verse 16, the fire of God. God's name is mentioned. That burned up his sheep. Okay, so we know that's God. What if you combine verse 15 and 16 together? Would Job go, oh, all these bad things are happening to me because God let it happen and God's trying to hone me. And No, I think it's possible Job would see verse 16 as God dealing with him, but he will still separate verse 15 as a normal bad thing that everyone goes through. If we separated these verses, the conclusion can come out differently. But it's impossible to separate the verses. Why? Because it's not just 15, 16. It's 13 through 19. They're all connected. They're not separated, okay? Now, I would like to ask you this question. Do you have a connection of all these horrible ruins, these bad events, like Job? No, all right? I can dare say that. Every single person did not go through as bad as Job did. And they didn't have such a coincidence that all these bad things happened at once on the same day, pretty much the same minute, if not the hour, okay? They're all connected together, so... God allowed this to happen. It's the devil's fault. I get that. He was attacked by Satan. But if you're not in that same connection of bad events like Job, then why do you act like you're Job and say, oh, the devil's attacking me. That's why bad things are happening. Oh, God, let this happen to me. God's trying to uh, teach me patience. And hey, man, uh, what if you separated your bad events? If you separated your bad event you would probably realize that, hey, this is actually a normal bad thing everybody else goes through. Wow. You know what would save you a lot of stress and pain? Is if you stop blaming the devil and God and start realizing that this is just a normal thing everybody else goes through. That will save you a lot of stress and self-inflicting pain. 
So why don't you start separating? What if you separated them? Then maybe you start being more realistic. Here's another thing. When there's something that we know God is trying to deal with us with the trial, we tend to mingle them with other bad things that happen to us that have no connection whatsoever. So let's say you go through five bad things in your life that are normal that everybody goes through. But only one bad thing that God is trying to teach and deal with you. You know what we tend to do? We connect this guy to this guy. And then we're like, oh, God is overwhelming me with hardship and trying my patience and the devil is really attacking me. No, my friend, it's just this one thing. Yeah. These five things are just normal things everybody goes through. So what's my point? My point is this. Are you mingling what God's dealing with you with the trial with other bad things in life that have no relationship whatsoever? If you do that, that's why you tend to dramatize your problems. See? Yeah. You go, oh, God's trying me. Oh, the devil's attacking me. You're not that special, bud. Right. Right. You're not that special. Yeah. Maybe if you start to realize these are normal things anybody else would go through in painful scenarios if these things were to happen to them, then probably you'd start to gird up your loins a little bit and start to take life and go through life seriously, more maturely. You know how to be better prepared for Satan's attack? If you don't over-dramatize Satan's attack. If you don't make it bigger than, oh, I can't handle it. Don't make it bigger than you can handle. You'd be surprised how merciful and good and gracious God is to your life. And that those bad things you're going through is unrelated to God or to the devil. It's just things that everybody else is going through. You can, uh, you can disagree with me on that statement, but there is such a thing. The Bible says at Deuteronomy 23.10, if there be among you any man that is not clean by reason of uncleanness, that chanceth him by night, then shall he go abroad out of the camp. He shall not come within the camp. Notice in this passage that chances are actually real to God. So you got to real. Uh, there's plenty of verses on that. The leper, uh, if a person gets inflicted with the disease, this person is not thinking, oh, God, may let this happen to me because he's trying to teach me a lesson and hold me forth as gold. And No, it just happened because this disease would happen to any other person. That's what that verse pointed out. You know what we tend to do if we were infected with the disease? God is trying my, no, stop. Oh, the devil attacked. No, stop. People in Deuteronomy, lepers in Deuteronomy, weren't thinking like that. Right. There are times that it can chance that it can happen. Why? Because, yes, God is in control of everything. There's no doubt about that. But what God does as the person who's in control, he says, whatever bad things happen, it's going to happen because of the consequence of sin. See, that's God's role. It's not like every minute detail, I'm going to let this bad thing happen from this evil. No, there are verses in Jeremiah that God never even thought of the evil. The only time that he's in control and sovereign is he just lets whatever bad thing happens to happen. Why? Because he allowed that to happen because of our sin. That's his only sovereign role. Don't blame every unfortunate event that God planned this all out and detailed it and made this happen to me. No, it just happens. You could save yourself a lot of trouble if you were to think that way. There are lost people who can take uh, hardships better in life than you Christians. You know why? Because they're like, this just happens. Everyone goes through it. Maybe you could save yourself a lot of trouble if you were to think that way. The sixth point is the reverence of Job. The reverence of Job in verse 20. In verse 20. Notice that as soon as these bad things happen, Job cursed God. No. In verse 20, Job reverenced God. He worshipped and praised Him. Now, in verse 20 through 22, notice that Job did not curse, right? But if you look at chapter 3, verse 1... Chapter 3, verse 1, Job cursed, right? What was the difference in chapter 1 where he didn't curse versus chapter 3 where he cursed? Look back. 
Look back before chapter 3. Look, look at the verse before chapter 3. Look at verse 13. So Job sat on the ground and worshipped and praised the Lord. Is that what it said at verse 13? No, it said, So they sat down with them upon the ground seven days and seven nights. That's a long time. And none spake a word unto him, for they saw that his grief was very great. There were seven days of silence where he did nothing but keep the grief to himself. What do you think is going to happen after that? Boom, then you'll curse. But chapter 1, did he sit on the ground seven days and... No, he immediately worshipped the Lord. That's a huge difference. There is no greater danger than you are by yourself in silence, keeping all that grief inside you and you do nothing about it. You will get bitter fast. You will get bitter and curse God easily. Why? Because that's how the devil attacks you. He will attack you when you're in silence. And, uh, and then those thoughts flood in. Those feelings kick in. You're giving so much time for the devil to work on your flesh. Give him zero time. Give the devil zero time. This is spiritual warfare. Why don't you fall on your knees and worship God? Because it always worked with you. Whenever you came to church, I know you had a bad day. But at least you weren't by yourself at home right, yeah. with your imagination. Right. It always worked when you came here. It always worked when you sang the hymns. It always worked when you hear another brother going through hardship like you and then you hear their testimony. It always worked when you read the Bible and prayed. It always worked when you were going through the bitterness and the struggle. You immediately surrendered that to the Lord and cried out for help. That always worked when you revered God. There is no greater danger than when you go through suffering is that you just sit still seven days and if you only come on a Sunday and you're waiting for seven days to the next Sunday, that's a lot of time gap for the devil. Like Job, seven days, seven nights, and then the grief builds up and bam. That's why some people don't come back to church anymore. They don't serve God anymore. You know what you should do when hardship happens? You should immediately worship God and praise Him. That helps, and you do know that. It does help. It doesn't take away the pain. It doesn't really solve it, but it does help. It keeps it going. My last point is remembrance of Job. Remembrance of Job. If you look at verse 21 through 22, isn't it amazing that this is probably the most famous verses that people remember Job by? Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this Job sin not, nor charge God foolishly. Wow. This is how we remember Job mostly. But did you forget his cursing for 12 chapters long? How can people forget about that? I mean, Job was talking about his self-righteousness, his complaint, his bitterness. He was cursing his day. I mean, what happened to those 12 chapters? Why doesn't that dawn in our mind? It's only these two little verses that we remember him by. Isn't it amazing how God, isn't this encouraging? Who made that record? The Holy Spirit, not Job. The Holy Spirit. Isn't it encouraging that God ignored all of Job's defects? And remembers him more for his patience and suffering at James 5, 10 through 11. He, never, he didn't really talk about Job's complaint. You notice that? He never talked about his bitterness. Never talked about his cursing. We only know that from the 12 chapters we read. But the Holy Spirit never mentioned that about Job. God chose to remember Job by his patience and suffering rather than his defect. And he rewarded him double after that. He didn't think of Job as a failure. He failed the test. He said, no, you passed. I'll reward you double. If you know about God <laughs> when you go through suffering, he tends to remember you more for your patience and suffering and rewards you. And all those defects you had in the middle of that suffering, it was just gone. It was just behind you. You and I are a testimony that, of that. You and I know that. 
Yeah. Do you, you, you ever thought about this? All that pain and suffering you went through, I mean, in spite of how many times you failed or you got bitter or you got upset or you didn't really live for God like you should have, he still rewarded you. He still blessed you after that. Yeah. What is that called? God is such a good God. Amen. He chooses to remember you, yeah. how you suffer, the patience that you endured through that suffering, not the defects. That's all he's choosing to remember. And he says, that's what I'm going to reward you for. Isn't God so good? Yeah. Isn't it encouraging to know that while you're going through your defects right now, right? While Satan is attacking you. That God's just focusing on how much you're enduring it, how much pain you're going through, and yet you try to keep going. That's good. Isn't that encouraging? Yes. You know, uh, we, don't, uh, we don't remember that ourselves, to be honest. We don't remember all the th things that, um, the good points or the endurance or what we suffered, but God remembers them. Yes. Didn't you realize this? God remembers your suffering more than you. Wow. I guarantee you this, all the bad things you went through in your life, Write me every detail of what happened. You can't. You forgot. I guarantee you this. There were some altar calls you went through where you poured out your suffering to the Lord that you forgot. But God remembered every teardrop that was shed on that altar and kept it in a book. Wow. Amen. Don't tell me God doesn't care. Psalm 56, verse 8. Thou tellest my wanderings. Put thou my tears into thy bottle. Are they not in thy book? Is it comforting to know that my God remembered the pain and the tragedy, the endurance, all that unbearable stuff? Remember that me. He would remember that better than me. That God would keep my tears, every teardrop that I shed during suffering that I endured, in his little bottle. You know, God, he wants to do that right now with you. He wants to remember. He wants to record your, your patience and your suffering, your tears. Here he puts a bottle for you. Why not? Put your tears in the bottle today. Every head bow and every eye shut.